This Week in Startups is brought to you by ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Twist listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twist. NetSuite by Oracle, the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy to use cloud platform. Get NetSuite's guide, crushing the five barriers to growth when you go to NetSuite.com slash twist. And Upstart, revolutionizing the process of personal lending. Checking your rate only takes two minutes and won't affect your credit at upstart.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. And it's going to be another startup tune-up. This is the show that we get tremendous feedback on. And it's a show in which companies that are coming out of incubators that we know and respect come into the studio. They pitch me the world's greatest angel investor, according to me. Um, and, and, you know, and statistics. I mean, it's just numbers, people. I mean, you just look at the scoreboard. Uh, nobody in the game has invested in more unicorns than me. I'm starting to sound more and more like Donald Trump. Huh? I mean, we're in a or jaggy. Everybody knows it. I've got more unicorns, okay, than anybody. You may have heard of a company called Robinhood. Okay, trade stocks. Maybe Uber. Okay, take a car wherever you want. Okay, I'm going to stop with the Trump impersonation. I know I'm triggering a lot of you out there right now. Don't worry. This too will pass. So today on the program, my friend Stonely Baptiste uh, emailed me and he said, Hey, Jason, come to Urban X Demo Day. And I said, absolutely not. I don't want to go to a Demo Day and be pinned in a corner by a zillion founders and a bunch of uh, angel investors. No, bring your companies to me and I will put them on This Week in Startups. And that is a much better deal. So if you have a great incubator, you got some great companies, email uh, Emmy Award winning producer Jackie, and uh, she will get you set up for uh, bringing them on the podcast. We're going to see four great companies today, and they're all part of Urban X. So Urban X is Urban Us is a venture is a venture firm, a seed fund, and they invest in a lot of companies with us. My friend Stonely Baptiste is the uh, co-founder of it. And Urban X is their incubator. So we have the launch incubator. Urban X is another one. And this one was created with um, the folks at Urban Us, the fund, as well as Mini, the car company. And this is something we're seeing more and more of. Corporations have venture arms and innovation arms. They call it like... Uh, corporate venture capital or corporate innovation, essentially the biggest companies, whether it's Disney or Rackspace or Microsoft, or in this case, Mini, they will uh, put a, a little bit of money aside, invest it in startups, and they'll typically partner with someone like Techstars, or in this case, Urbanus, to run the program because they have never run a program. And they take a small, modest investment. In this case, uh, UrbanX invests 100K along with Mini. So it's you know, think about it as 50K from each. And so you have to ask, why are they doing that? Why are these big corporates doing it? Well, the pace of innovation is so great in startups that the large companies are scared to death that they are going to get left behind. And so what they do, and I'm not saying many scared to death, but hey, maybe um, all of these big organizations, they just want to get closer to entrepreneurs. So I frequently get asked, this is a good or a bad thing. It's a great thing. It's a great thing for you to build a relationship with uh, a bunch of these big companies, as long as they're not on your board of directors or they don't have access to inside information. So putting all that aside, we're going to have four great companies today. They're going to pitch me for two minutes. Then I'm going to ask them a couple of questions and I'm going to evaluate them. And I'm going to rank the four companies with the lens of how fundable will they be by top tier venture capitalists? These four brave founders have agreed to take the red pill, not the blue pill, the red pill. They want un the unvarnished truth. They want the honesty. They want to know exactly where they stand in relation to each other and the market. And I am more than willing to be my candid, judgmental self. Finally, I found a venue for my judgmental um, tendencies. And some people ask me, Jason, you're so hard on these companies, these founders sometimes. I always ask people. In my younger years, yes, I was a little precocious and I would just start laying into people. Now I always ask, do you want the red pill or the blue pill? I can sugarcoat it or I can be unvarnished truth. And I've learned techniques of how to give feedback to founders that isn't soul crushing, uh, but that is in fact uplifting and that builds a bond. And that's important for me as an angel investor because I really don't want people to leave a meeting with me feeling bad. What I want them to do is say, 
wow, Jason really listened to me. His team listened to me. They understand me. And they gave me some of the best advice I ever got. And they, they told me a couple of leaks in their game uh, and a couple of leaks in my game. And so that's the spirit in which this all occurs. Lest you want to email Jason at Calacanis and tell me, oh, you were too hard on that company. Trust me. Life is hard. It's a zero-sum game. There are no participation trophies. You get nothing for showing up. You've got to put effort in this life. All right, let's get to it. Yell Fox, you're the founder and CEO of Rent Logic. That, yes, that's correct. Okay, good. So we're off to a strong start. Correct. You, 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 you know your company and you know you're the founder and CEO. Rent Logic is based where? We're based in New York City right now. Ah, very nice. My hometown. Where in New York City do you live? Where is the company headquartered? Uh, I live in Flatiron, and the company is headquartered right next to Grand Central Station. All right. So you are in the 20s, like Madison Square Park-ish, between Madison Square Park and Union Square. That's a great area. Yes. Uh, we used to have the largest rats in the entire city in Union Square and Madison Square. But I, I, I've heard that the rats are gone. Is this true? They moved up to uh, Washington or in, Inwood. <laughs> Got it. So the rats are out. Uh, but it, that's actually where my first office was. Uh, when I was starting Silicon Alley <laughs> Reporter, I was on 19th Street between uh, 6th and 7th. Great area of town. You got the Shake Shack there in Madison Square Park. And where do you live? Uh, I live right at 24th and 5th. Oh, right. So, yeah. And the company's in Grand Central. Yes. So you're up on like the 42nd Street area? Isn't that a high rent district? Uh, it's, it's in a place called Grand Central Tech. So it's a oh. co-working space uh. um, that's subsidized by the city of New York for people that are trying to make cities better places to live. Wow, look at you. You're, you're checking all the boxes. You got the free office space or discount office space, is it? It's discounted, yes. So heavily discounted, what, 250 a desk? A um, little bit more than that. Yeah. But. All right. Uh, so now I'm going to give you two minutes to present Rent Logic. Uh, when we get to two minutes, you're going to hear a little clacker. Do we have the clacker or no? No. Okay. So what we'll do is uh, when you hit two minutes, you're going to hear a snap like that. Jackie will snap. Two, two minutes for him to pitch, yes. to me. When he gets to two minutes, I want you to go. Okay. Can you snap? Let me hear it. Perfect. When you hear that, wrap up your, your thought. Wrap up on that sentence so we can keep the trains moving. Are you ready? Yes. Let's pull up his deck. Are we going to do the deck on the screen? There it is. Three, two, go. So the company is called Rent Logic, and what we do is we grade apartment buildings, A through F, very similar to how cities grade restaurants. And we're evaluating them based on health and safety. So currently, hmm. renters use our site to find a place to live that isn't going to have mold or bed bugs or heat and hot water problems. Landlords also use us to differentiate their apartment rentals as better than competitors. Right now, 80% of millennials rent and spend more than 50% of their paychecks on it. And so we use rating systems to advise us on a number of different decisions. We have Zagat for restaurants, we have Carfax for cars, but for apartments, our single biggest expense, we actually have nothing really good. Currently, there's online review sites um, where you can go in and just say what it's like to live in your building, but they're completely subjective and they skew negatively. They don't provide any sort of information that's valuable. So our information comes from the cities. So cities, cities send inspectors to evaluate uh, buildings, whether or not they're compliant with code. So we take that information, combine it with on-site physical inspections that we send third-party licensed by state appraisers to do. We combine it all to create a 100% objective score for a building that works kind of like a credit rating, except it's on the building. A lot of standards organizations, which is what we are, have like a gold, silver, platinum. Um, that's, subject, that, that's biased because only the good players want to come out and be evaluated. So we actually grade every single building in New York City. You don't have to subscribe to the system. You can type in any address and it's there. Business model is similar to LEED. Uh, we charge 20 cents per unit per month. So that's $250 for the smallest building in the Lower East Side, $5,000 for the largest building in annual uh, licensing and inspection fees. Current customers include Blackstone, which is uh, one of the largest landlords in the world, uh, Phipps Houses, which is a nonprofit affordable housing provider, and DSA Property Group. They're a smaller independent shop. They all purchase this product for completely different reasons. So our signs go up around town. And you can walk up to them, tap your phone to it, see a building health report card, see if there's any listings. And it's important to notice that these kind of act like out-of-home advertising. So every ad is assigned for the building and for rent logic. Great. There. All right. Let's give him a little golf clap here. I got a little studio audience. We might as well give him a golf clap. Um, wow. They taught you how to present at that uh, Ur Urban X uh, incubator accelerator, apparently. Very good presentation. And I've been looking for a company to do something like what I've been calling the truth about homes, like mm -hmm. some way of reviewing homes, because that's a big considered purchase, and 
realtors are largely going to do whatever it takes, including lying or deceiving customers at times by doing like photoshopping photos, et cetera, to get you to make a transaction. So I've always wondered why doesn't somebody build a service like this? Um, and I see that you are using a great combination of publicly available stuff, making it look better, which is good, normalizing the data. And I see that you've got a revenue model where you're going to make a couple of hundred bucks to a couple of thousand bucks per year off the landlord. So they are paying you. That's correct. Now, this leads to, of course, the issue which you tried to head off, but I don't think you did a great job of, so I'm going to let you do that now. I always like to ask the toughest question is, if you're getting paid by apartment building owners, how on earth do you consider yourself unbiased? So what we've done is there's Rent Logic, which is the for-profit corporation, and then we have a, sub, uh, a subsidiary called Mosaic. And what that has on it is a board that determines what it means to be an A. On that board, we have representation from the mayor's office, public advocate, comptroller, but also large institutional landlords, um, smaller independent landlords, banks and insurance companies. And they essentially develop what it means to create the standards. I do not, as a CEO of RentLogic, I do not have a vote on that board. RentLogic mm -hmm. then executes the standards and builds it into the inspections. Yeah, I like that even less. I'll tell you why. I think that the politicians are all paid off by the real estate folks. And I didn't hear you mention any uh, people living in the things on that board. So that made I, me think, oh, wow, this is just window dressing. I spoke a little bit too soon. We have the largest tenant advocacy group, New York Communities for Change, on the okay. board, as well as renters, as well as someone who was evicted and lives in a homeless shelter right now. Okay, so you cut me off of in the past. That's a pretty good answer. I do think that you should not give that over to a group. I would rather your organization, US CEO, take ownership of what is a great apartment and you lead that because I think going to some committee and having a debate about it is going to result in like milk toast, middle of the road decisions. Whereas I would rather see you say, this is what like Zagat does. This is, or Michelin stars do. This is what excellence is. So why did you choose to take the core premise of your product and outsource it to a bunch of other people in some nonprofit. I don't like this decision. Because there's so many different opinions on, on what it means to be a good building, and we want to take into account the landlord and the tenant's decisions and meet halfway. So we sit right in the middle of both parties, which also means that people come at us from both sides. Hmm. Why don't you just make the decision? You're scared? We, we did. We made the first decision. We haven't had the first board meeting to oh, okay. evaluate it yet, but the first set of standards are basically mirrored off mm. the city's code violations and, and the actual laws for what it means to maintain right. a building. I like it. I liked your answer. I was pushing back a little bit. So for people who are listening, you got to push back a little bit as an investor and you want to see if the founder can defend their position. So what you saw there was, I don't actually assume that I know what the better decision is. My gut tells me the better decision is for the CEO to have a vision and for them to just decide. But I like your feedback. I think you held your own there. So I think that's a good lesson, I think, for people listening is when, a, when an investor comes at you with questions, and you see I was being a little persnickety there and holding my position, and I wanted to see if you actually had a thesis to defend your position. I give you like a B plus in your defense. I still think I'm right. Um, and I'll, you know, you're going to deal with investors over time who just think they're really smart and have seen it all. In some cases, they have. They could also be wrong. So this is the back and forth uh, in the investor-founder relationship that we see. But overall, I really like your business. Um, and you have how many paying customers now, Ballpark? Hundreds, uh, thousands? We have 100 paying customers. Fantastic. So you're just getting to the point where reality is setting in, and you can actually see if people churn. Yes, so... Have people churned. And when they did churn, what was the reason given? Um, Surprisingly, we have a 0% churn rate right now on our first 100 building pilot. The renewals are in November, Okay, but we've spoke Great. to landlords and for a company like Blackstone, paying 5,000 bucks for a licensing agreement isn't enough to warrant a churn. Got it. And so um, for those people listening who are founders and also who are new investors, um, when you hear great early traction, the next thing you're going to want to do is start to dig into that traction. You're going to want to ask the founder who's churned and why. Sometimes the founder will actually be tracking that and they could speak to it. Other times the founder will be like, yeah, nobody churns, which is sort of what you're saying. In your case, it makes sense because you haven't gotten to the one year renewal. But future success for your company is going to be determined by, I predict. VCs will determine if they want to make a big bet on you based upon churn and 
uh, the ability for you to land and expand. In other words, if Blackstone has one building, do they go to 10 or do they go to 50 or do they just go to two? So landing and expanding and studying the churn. Are you hiring? I bet you are if you're listening to this program and posting to job sites and waiting and waiting for the right people to see it. Oh my God, it's so arduous and so painful. Well, ZipRecruiter has built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. It learns what you're looking for, it identifies people with the right experience, and then it invites them. They invite them to apply for your job. And these invitations have revolutionized how you will find your next key team member. And each of those slots, especially in a startup matter, you know that. 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site, wait for it, in just one day. ZipRecruiter even spotlights the strongest applications you receive so you never miss a great match and you can prioritize who you're going to go after first. The right candidates are out there and ZipRecruiter will help you find them. They know how to do it. Businesses of all sizes trust ZipRecruiter for their hiring needs. So right now, Twist listeners can go to ZipRecruiter and try it for free. That's right, for free. You can try it. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash twist. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash twist. It's the smartest way to hire. Thanks again to our friends at ZipRecruiter for supporting This Week in Startups. We truly appreciate it and we love your product. We've gotten some great candidates from it. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Let me ask you, Yale Fox, which is absolutely fantastic name by the way is that your is that given to you or did you make this up it's my real name you know if you made it up i would give you bonus (laughs) points yale fox i like it sounds like a comedian or something yeah sounds like you're on tour uh tonight on johnny carson yale fox funny guy um yeah tell us what is your biggest i always like to give a founder an opportunity to tell me what's their biggest challenge personally and or professionally that you might want some feedback on or advice from me. So the next step with our company right now is to scale, to start to put this into other cities. Mm -hmm. It's different than a Facebook where you just turn it on and it works everywhere like a pure tech company. We have to go. There's a little bit of localization in each market and companies like Uber and Ritual have all done slightly different approaches. But what do you think the best way for us to scale prioritizing speed over everything? Great question. Uh, So it's interesting that you bring up Facebook. In fact, Facebook did not just turn on in every region. They contained it to Ivy League universities. They created a sense of FOMO, fear of missing out, Mm -hmm. and they built up demand, and they slowly deployed it. Tesla built up 500,000 reservations, started deploying it. Um, You know, thinking about other companies, Superhuman, we're an investor in the Gmail company. I think they have, you know, either hundreds of thousands or some large number of people on the waiting list and they onboard only 30 new customers or 50 new customers a week because I like to train them. So there is something called a playbook. And what Uber did going from city to city was they created a playbook and then they found people who matched a certain profile in each city, people who were aggressive, wanted to succeed, um, maybe were, I don't want to say rule benders, but... They were willing to take chances locally, et cetera. Now, you may have a different playbook. And then what happens is, as you go to different cities, what you, what's important is that you're cognizant of what happened in each city, what went well, what didn't, and you record those best practices and you discuss them. So creating an Asana list of here is our playbook in Asana. When we launch a new city, here's the 100 things we do. And then having discussions around it. And then maybe having a Slack channel where you discuss the Asana punch list of what has to occur on day one, day 10, et cetera, like a rollout plan. And then you as the CEO have to hold your people accountable to not only executing against that punch list, but evolving that punch list. And you got to take people out of their comfort zone and say, listen, this is the fourth city. You just did Milwaukee. What didn't work in your city and why? Because like you're saying, there could be cities where it's highly fragmented. You could have cities that, you know, the landlords are a bunch of Blackstones, right? So there might be different sales processes, et cetera. Um, But uh, that's, it it requires you being present and having a processes and then demanding that people give feedback on it. I'll give you just a small microcosm. I've been doing events for 25 years since the early 90s. I create a document called lessons learned for every event we do we start it two or three weeks before 
each person in the company has a section they have to fill out. And then whoever's running the event has to make sure that each individual in our company writes what they think went well, what went poorly, and just ideas and observations. Then we go over them in a lunch. This is being present, right? Mm -hmm. And having somebody demand that people give some feedback. So that's what I would do. Great company, great presentation, great question. Uh, and when we get back, we'll meet another one of the Urban X uh, accelerators companies. Of course, they're powered by many. Here's a slight aside for you. My first car was a 73 Mustang Grande that cost me 600. That was used, obviously. I bought it when I was 16 or maybe 17 or 18 years old. My first new car, Mini Cooper. I love that car. The second year it came out, I bought that Mini Cooper, and I loved it. What a fantastic vehicle. Our next founder is Nikki Chu. That's right. Welcome. Your company is campsite.com, S-Y-T-E. Correct. You couldn't get the I, so you're couldn't faking it till I. you make it. Okay. Campsite, urban outdoor space. Two minutes on the clock. And remember, some people are, most people are just listening. So if you have something that's visual, um, always make sure when you're on a podcast that you describe what's on the screen. Three, two, go. Thank you, Jason. So we know that spending time outside is good for us. It improves your creativity, your problem solving, and your feelings of well-being. Almost a 19% boost in productivity when you spend time outside. So what Campsite is doing is we're taking parking lots, and what I'm showing right now is a 3,200 square foot parking lot that houses seven cars, and we're converting it into awesome, usable outdoor space. So our one prototype in San Francisco contains trees, shrubs, washroom, Wi-Fi, electricity, outdoor seating, so that people can spend time doing this. It's a place where people can co-work, they can host meetings, they can socialize, and generally spend more time outside. We're following the WeWork model where WeWork takes an office building, adds furniture and services. Campsite takes a parking lot, adds furniture and services to get additional value. We have two products, a $39 per month membership and a full buyout of the space charged at $500 per hour. Our one location makes $227,000. That's roughly $180,000 from events and $47,000 from memberships. Your typical service parking lot makes $4.90 per square foot per year. Campsite makes $33.93 per square foot per year. That's almost a 10x return off the traditional model. So the companies that you love, love us. It's companies like PayPal, Salesforce, LinkedIn, Strava, all use us for either memberships or corporate buyouts. We currently have four times as many inquiries as we can fill. We believe that being in 100 cities is a $2.5 billion opportunity, and we're the exact team to, to get us there. We're basically building parking lots and uh, making them back into paradise. Okay. Well done. Let's give her a golf clap. Nicely done. Thanks. Very nice. Um, wonderful presentation. Uh, fabulously creative idea. Thank you. Um, my good friend Tony Shea at Zappos has a trailer park container. It's trailers, actually, and I've stayed there two or three times, and when I go to Vegas, you know, I typically get comped a room or get a highly discounted room because of, you know, playing for being a gambler, and I choose to stay with Tony most times, as opposed to staying at the Aria or the Mandarin Oriental or whatever, and I stay in an Airstream, and the reason I do is because I do like this idea of coming out of the Airstream, sitting by the campfire, having coffee, and um, collisions that happen, so it's a wonderful idea. Um, it's super creative. I think the way you presented it was exceptional in that everything that a VC would ask or an investor would ask, you cut them off at the pass in very deft fashion with a single slide. And so this is one of the high arts of building a deck is one message per slide and you had like your logo slide. People love us. And that slide was a little bit dicey because... I wasn't sure exactly how you were framing it. Like, so be careful there. If like I work for Uber and I bought a $39 membership, I'm not sure that counts as Uber being your customer or not. So just be wary of that, that people are going to dig into those logos. Uh, maybe these people have used us for corporate events and our members work at companies like this. Be more explicit because when you use the logo as a strategy in your deck, and it's a valid strategy, sure, they call it lighthouse customers, they, they shine a light that other people follow uh, through the darkness, people are going to dig into it, 
and it, it's got to be intellectually honest. So I just thought that slide was a little problematic, and you're like, people love us. Define it. Make it two slides. People who are members come from companies like this. People who've rented it include people like this. It would be more impactful because it's more factual, and it builds your credibility. And I like how you've gotten it down to, hey, here is how much these parking lots uh, make per you know dollar amount, et cetera. So I guess I have the two questions that I think downstream investors will have and I would have is one, what happens when it rains? Yep. Like, and what's the limitation of this? And do you have a plan for that in terms of heat? And, you know, it's cold in San Francisco. I don't want to sit outside and then, et cetera. And then number two, regulation. Is it legal to do this? How do you, and this is something I think Urban Us and the Urban X um, accelerator must address is how do you navigate what did the city of San Francisco think of you doing this? Did they come and give you a fine or did they come and give you a high five or both? Yeah, great question. So the first question about weather, November and December were two of our biggest months. And that is because um, we do provide a certain amount of infrastructure when it's rainy and people still want to spend time outside um, if they're comfortable. When you say infrastructure, do you mean a tent? So we do additional uh, like sail shades and more heat lamps. Got it. Okay. And do those sail shades help in the rain or not they do they do so they are yeah um and i guess if this works out you could put an awning over the entire space and if it was drizzling it'd be okay i mean in a thunderstorm it wouldn't be Correct. Uh, okay now let's get to regulations yeah san francisco is notorious for having multiple organizations give uh multiple opinions yes and you got this one up and running uh, be candid how has that gone has it been arduous or just painful yeah, painful for sure at San Francisco. Um, we started as the idea of having outdoor co-working. And so we didn't really plan to have events. Um, so the city definitely sort of slapped us on the wrist for having more than, you know, 10 to 15 people in the space at one time. Oh. Um, so we're currently working through that uh, right now. Right. And in a location, that means you have to either file for having an event or get okayed as an event space or something? Yeah, that's right. So we're moving more towards the latter of the two so that we can have events whenever we want. Got it. Um, and then that means the neighbors have to agree, et cetera. Correct. Which then might limit where you can put these. Correct. And neighbors and the NIMBY movement is brutal. Correct? It can be, yes. Yeah. yeah. So what city would be the most accommodating, you think? Austin? San ooh. Diego? Um, Los Angeles? Probably Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, because you, you have like 50 different communities you could swing the bat and say, and you're going to rent these parking lots as opposed to buy them. Correct. Hmm. Here, I'm going to give you just one pro tip to think about. Yeah. Um, I think there's so much money out there in the world, and this is such a good idea, that you should try to build a sidecar fund to buy parking lots to do this in and own them. Yes. And then sit on them. And this is like a way to monetize them while you sit on them and they appreciate in value. And if you put these in areas that are not in uh, places you would expect, um, like let's say Culver City is the main area in uh, Los Angeles, whatever the area just east of it is or just north of it, like there might be one of these available. So you can kind of just go a little bit off and then you could go – like create a REIT or something like that, one of those real estate investments. You've yeah. thought about this? Yeah, so, yes. Yeah. Um, All right. Uh, well, this is super fascinating. I think um, I really like the design too. Thank you. And I think it's a great idea. And I'm not sure about the why. Why the why? Why so the why? So city has a why, and we're focused ah, on okay. dense urban environments. Okay. I like it. Yeah, urban campsite, urban camping. You, yeah, campsite. I like it. I'll go with campsite. I like single word, even if it's misspelled. All right. When we get back, one more start, two more startups, and I will rank the startups in how likely they are to raise a Series A when we get back. Are shared spreadsheets, manual processes, and legacy systems costing your startup time and money? Well, now is the time to move your business to the cloud. NetSuite by Oracle is the business management software, BMS, that handles every aspect of your business in an easy to use cloud platform. You've heard of NetSuite, of course, and you can save time and money and unneeded headaches by managing sales and finance and accounting and orders and HR right from your desk instantly or even on your phone. 
thousands of the best known brands and fastest growing companies use NetSuite to manage their business and now it is available to you. And the power of the world's most popular cloud management system is more affordable than you think. So here is your call to action. NetSuite is offering you valuable insights to overcome the obstacles that are holding you back and they're doing it for free. Unleash your business's full potential with this free guide, Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth. I want you to get Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth when you go to netsuite.com slash twist. That domain name again, netsuite.com slash T-W-I-S-T. Those five barriers to growth, you probably have heard me tell you them before. Finding your next customer, critically important. Increasing your profits, which you're going to reinvest into your company, obviously. Cash flow visibility, huh? You can't run out of money. Tackling regulations, critically important. And building a winning team. Boy, is that one important. Those are the five barriers to growth. And you're going to want to get this wonderful, wonderful guide at netsuite.com slash twist. netsuite.com slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing program. Okay, everybody, we're going to do another amazing startup. This one is Clear Road and Paul Salama. That's correct. That's correct. Is the COO. Your founder and CEO, Frederic, was too busy to pitch me. Is that right? Tread That's lightly. A way here. of saying it. <laughs> what happened? Is, Wait, where's he has the a fr- You know what? Actually, he has a French accent, and so we figured that my American accent would, <laughs> would, uh, would go better on the, bon on, on the air. Uh, I would have loved a little French accent right now, but Frederic, this is e- this is a power move. I'm just a message to Frederic sending your COO and meeting with another investor instead of me. That is like the ultimate neg. Now I have to wonder, like, there's probably ten more important investors than me. He was terrified, actually, of of me <laughs> or of of you in particular. Really? Oh God, I got to work on that. I mean, I, it, that, I do get that once in a while, like. Uh, all right, here we go. Paul, uh, the COO of Clear Road. You have two minutes on the clock. Three, two, go. Thanks, Jason. So in America, the um, people's least favorite activity is the drive commute in the morning. Um, and that's no surprise, given how terrible our roads are. We're actually facing a backlog of almost a trillion dollars. We relied on gas taxes, but th- these are becoming obsolete. And actually, tolling solutions um, eat up 40% of the revenue in the, in the system costs. So Clear Road is solving this funding crisis with micro tolling. That is charging drivers a very small amount based on the miles that they drive um, on any road, actually. And we're doing this. Our secret is that we collect old data, data that's already being provided from connected vehicle technologies. So your OnStar system, your Metro Mile devices, or fleet tracking systems, or even the smartphones on your dashboard. And we're doing this already. We're tolling more miles of highways than the entire tolling industry in the United States. In Oregon and Washington, we have drivers paying by the mile across the entire states. We aggregate this data into trips and convert those trips into financial transactions on behalf of government. Our model is like any online payment processor. We charge a per transaction fee, and this ends up being one-tenth the cost of traditional tolling. We are experts in tolling and finance. Um, Having, in a previous venture, uh, created a a tolling system across the entire French highway network, and we see this as a huge opportunity for pricing the road with micro-tolling, over $200 billion. But right now we're focused on the West Coast, uh, which is a pipeline of projects that are ongoing in the next year that are uh, set to leapfrog gas taxes and tolling. But micro-tolling is also an opportunity to manage our streets uh, with all the new vehicles, scooters, trucks, even autonomous vehicles. Wherever we're going, we're going to need roads, Clear Road is making sure we can pay for them. All right, well done. Let's give Paul an amazing golf clap there. That was a very strong presentation. Well done. Um, So it's a little confusing because it's a new concept. Sure. And you understand that because you've named it micro-tolling. So if I'm to understand this, I think you could have done a little bit of a better job of just defining what micro-tolling is versus what we all know already. So I think everybody who's going to hear your pitch has an easy pass-like device or a toll device that charges them for going over bridges and tunnels. Sometimes they've experienced the 
paid HOV lane experiments in Southern California. That's the only ones I know of in California. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I've experienced it once or twice. I think going out to Coachella, there was actually one. Um, And I got in trouble because I had my easy pass. I got a fine because my easy pass was happened to be turned off for some reason. And I wound up getting a ticket for going in there, but I thought it was pretty cool. So what is the difference between micro tolling and what we've all experienced, which is using our easy pass for going through a tunnel or the new easy pass, like HOV lane paid kind of stuff? Sure. Uh, con- I mean, conceptually, it's very similar. You're, you're paying for the usage of the road, but we use GPS systems or, or just mileage, other mileage trackers to not actually require any uh, physical infrastructure. So okay. we're using the, you know, plug in a device into a car or, or a cell phone, and we're saying, you drove 10 miles, therefore, and, and that mile, you know, those miles have a certain rate, then we're going to say, okay, at the end, you're charged 27 cents or something like that. So everybody who drives on that road has to pay, is the idea? Yes. I mean, ev- and, eventually. <laughs> eventually. Yeah. But right now you're doing this, are people donating their money then and doing this out of so the goodness of their heart? They're actually, um, you're, they're getting reimbursed for gas taxes. Got it. So you have a deployment today. Yes. Where? Oregon. And in Oregon, if I drive on certain roads, I am required to have my... On f- any roads, actually. So any In road. Oregon, you have to have your software? In running? Oregon, the, the, the people who have opted into this program... Ah, it's opt-in. Opt-in for now, yes. Got it. ...are paying a set per mile fee on every road. Why would somebody opt in to pay money to drive on a road when other people are driving on it for free? Well, they're so they're not paying. They're not paying. Um, they are paying gas taxes actually. So uh, in Oregon, about seventy cents of each gallon for each gallon of gas is going to taxes in the federal government and the state government. Okay. So why would I opt in? I'm still confused. Oh, it's a great, it's a good question. Um, there is so if you, right now if you are a more a, a less efficient car, um, you might get a good deal by switching to this. But also there are certain early adopters who who see this as the future and say, oh, I want to participate. Even we actually have electric vehicles who feel bad about their non non contribution to uh, highway trust funds. But don't we pay taxes, and that's how we pay for the roads? Uh, for the most part, you're you're paying uh, the taxes that you're paying to contribute to the roads are the gas taxes which you're paying right. at the, for a gallon So people of gas. are opting in, yes. power users are opting in to use your system yeah. to pay additional taxes. A, se- a different set of taxes, yes. This is the craziest thing I've ever heard. How many people have opted in to pay more tax? I mean, th- these, are, these are capped programs, so we're right. talking about a, so a, a few thousand. Got it. Okay, I'm completely confused by this, <laughs> why anybody would opt in. Um, but the idea is eventually states would mandate that you either log in with Onstar or log in with the app or log in with some right. ODB port. Exactly. Um, ODB I mean, is what it's called? ODB. Yeah, ODB2. Yeah, That's ODB exactly two. right. I mean, uh, electric vehicles is, is, is definitely a low-hanging fruit where s- s- some states are saying you're going to have to pay a surcharge every year in your, in your registration fee. So this is a really nice alternative. Wait, wait they're going to charge me to have an electric vehicle? Uh, there are 20 states that are doing this right now. Why would they charge to have an electric vehicle? We, don't we want to... I thought the incentive was to give people a discount and a tax credit for it. Now You're, we're going to charge them? That's a very California perspective, but yes. Um, I mean, there, there are plenty of states who are saying, you are not contributing your fair share to ah. the roads, and so we're going to make Because you don't use... consume gas. Exactly. Oh my God, the world is bonkers. Um, I could see, though, the advantage of this in that you could deploy it without having to... Um, to install infrastructure. Install infrastructure. So yeah. that's pretty neat. Yeah. I don't understand how peop- why people would opt in to pay more, but I'm open-minded to it. I guess people do crowdsource stuff. It, um, do you fix the roads based upon the donations? Like, well, I mean, that, and, you know, if you're using the same GPS data, you can uh, really be legible about how you're contributing to the roads and say, okay, you drove on this road and you're contributing to this fund to support the reconstruction of this uh, road. Interesting. I would rather have somebody do, I'm just thinking about this, a crowdsource project to do a matching of making roads wider or bigger. Have you thought about that? Not, not wider or bigger, perhaps adding bike lanes or ah. something similar. See, that would be really interesting if you said, hey, we'll add a bike lane to, you know, the Bay Bridge. It'll cost this amount. And if the public puts up a third mm-hmm. and corporate partners put up a third, the city will put up a third and we'll do it just to show that there's demand. Right. It's interesting. Okay. Uh, fascinating. Thank you, Paul. Uh, let's give him a golf clap. Well done. 
last but not least in our randomly selected, uh, we randomly selected the order here, our fourth company. And after this, I will pass judgment alone. And it will, I'll take you through my thinking on it. Next up, Jordan Klein. He's the co-founder and CEO. Always important to say co-founder when there are other co-founders. You don't want people feeling bad. Uh, co-founder and CEO of Park and Diamond. I don't know what Park dash and dash Diamond is, but I'll give you mad props for the retro awkward dashes in your name of your yeah, domain name. Thank you. Uh, if you just put Park dash and dash Diamond dash net dot org, <laughs> that would have been better. But I'm going to go. Okay, with the retro, it's like wearing an ugly sweater to Christmas, park-n-diamond.com. Yeah. It's like awkward and weird because somebody had it already. We have park and diamond normally as well. Oh, you do? Yeah. Trust me, I regret the dashes every time I log into an email. You like the dashes? No, I regret it every single time I log in with my email. Yes. Yeah. Because you have to... Do, yeah, oh, okay. It's the worst. All right. I'm mobile well, too. Um, we got to get P at P... Yeah, parkdiamond.com would be better. Let's uh, put two minutes on the clock for you, Jordan. Three, two, go. Sure. Hey, Jason. So I'm the co-founder and CEO of Park and Diamond. And three years ago, my co-founder, David, and his family were struck by tragedy. His sister, Rachel, was riding her bike through the intersection of Park and Diamond in Philadelphia when she was hit by a car in a hit and run and was not wearing a helmet. As a result, she spent the next four months in a coma. And we quickly learned that she was just one of 85,000 Americans that year alone to suffer a traumatic brain injury as a result of a cycling-related crash, which cost the healthcare industry over $10 billion. And this problem is only getting bigger as we're seeing a generational shift away from cars and towards micromobility, and there's currently no viable safety solution for this market. So we built the first company uh, for safety around micromobility. And this all starts with the bicycle helmet, as less than 10% of these commuters are wearing a helmet every day as they go to work. Especially considering the fact that helmets are nearly 90% effective at reducing the likelihood of a traumatic brain injury, and are nearly 100% effective at reducing fatalities. So what we did is we designed the, designed the first helmet that combines safety with comfort, portability, and aesthetics, which means that it can fit into nearly any bag, um, and so you could take it with you everywhere you're going. And enabling this is our own proprietary patent-pending material that we've developed in-house ourselves over the past three years. And as you can see here, it's significantly more efficient at absorbing energy, meaning your head doesn't bounce, which reduces the likelihood of a brain injury. Our team has uh, helped us build this can, and consists of former SpaceX engineers. We also have partnerships with companies such as Ansys, which is one of the industry leaders for simulation software. We launched the product um, last week on Tuesday, right before demo day, and we've done almost $500,000 in sales in the past week, which has been awesome. But really what this means is that we're going to be protecting 5,000 heads when we deliver in Q1 2019. And a really cool factoid about our, our campaign is that almost 30% of the sales were two-plus helmets, meaning people are not just protecting themselves, but they're protecting loved ones, which is really awesome. So we're well on our way to protect over a million heads daily, and I'll give a shameless plug to pre-order the product if you're watching. All right. Well done. Let's give them a golf clap. Thank you. None of us are ever going to forget parkanddiamond.com. Um, it's always an interesting moment when you say, why did you start this company? Yeah. And personal tragedy uh, or things that hit home are one of the great motivators for change and entrepreneurship in this world. Yeah. And so I love a startup that has founders who are super vested in it and really want to change the world for an important reason. And this is one of the reasons I tell people that entrepreneurs and capitalism is so important in mm. the world. Yeah. There are governments and agencies who are trying to give people tickets and... You know, they're giving bird scooter people tickets you yeah. know, on Santa Monica Boulevard by the promenade, and they want to pass legislation, and they want to, you know, and the truth is that an entrepreneur with a great idea who studies a market can make much more impact than a government, a nonprofit, on average. And, uh, you know, sometimes you get a great nonprofit out there, Amnesty International changes the world, sure. but most times... They're just paying for office space and people's salaries. It's the entrepreneurs who solve problems. And what I love about your solution is you understand why people don't wear helmets. Exactly, yeah. And you don't parse that and pretend that aesthetics mm -hmm. is not the reason. Sure. Or convenience. Or comfort. Or comfort. People don't wear helmets because they are uncomfortable, awkward, dorky, and aesthetic reasons. Mm -hmm. And they're not portable. Totally. Inconvenience. And when you think about it, that's a completely illogical decision. But sure. you're not trying to fight that. Not at all. You're saying, let's adapt. 
Let's make it convenient. And what I found most striking and educational is one of the great things about being an angel investor is that the smartest people in the world who are spending 100 hours a week trying to solve important problems educate you. What's so great here is that I didn't know that yours absorbed better mm -hmm. and didn't create a bounce. Yeah. As everybody who's seen the frontline documentary about football players and brain sure. injuries and lesions in people's brains, when you get hit, even once, it creates lesions in your brain. And it's because your brain starts rattling around inside your skull because mm -hmm. a lot of these helmets cause that. They're like yeah. bells. And your brain is like the little thing inside the bell getting rung. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Partially. You yeah. guys... Partially, okay. You guys figured out that a softer approach is better. Yeah. Is that backed up by any science or evidence other than the video we saw, which was quite compelling? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah. So actually, a lot of the research that's been coming out of the football industry has shown that having a more compliant outer shell can aid in reducing the likelihood of a, of a brain injury. Mm, fascinating. Yeah. Did you mention the cost of these helmets? I'm going to guess it's 50 bucks. Um, so we're going to sell them for 80. Um, okay. Yeah. But at scale, they'll be down to 50? Yeah, hopefully. So really, our mission is to protect as many people as possible, and we can't do that at like a $300 price point. Of course not. By the way, people buying two, you may want to ask them why they're buying two. Okay. My gut is that they're not buying two for a friend. They're buying two to keep one at home, one at work, mm. one, you know? Yeah. Like, I think that's probably what it is, is sure. the convenience of having multiple helmets around. That as well. Um, We're also getting a lot of four-pack plus sales as wow. well. Yeah. Uh, have you done a partnership with any of the biking, I'm sorry, the um, scooter share. companies yet. So we or, are- Or, or yeah. sharing. Yeah, so we're talking to pretty much every bike share program um, and things are looking very promising. Got it. Yeah. So the answer to my question is no. Yeah. However, we're in discussions. However, exactly. Got it. We're currently in discussions. Great. Um, I think that's the home run is yeah. branding these or co-branding them. What people don't realize is if you made these for Lime scooters or jump sure. bikes- Yeah. You could make them with their logo on them. Exactly. They could give them out for free to people who sign up. And as part of signing up, they could activate people on the street, give them the helmet when they sign up if they just pay 30 bucks into their account to prefund their account. Sure. Have you discussed any concept like that with them? Yeah, we've discussed everything from fleet level deployment where one of these helmets would be on every single vehicle they have in their fleet to promotional giveaways and other ways to kind of activate consumers. There's a ton of what they like to define as practical commuters who won't use their system because of the helmet issue. Mm. And they see this as an avenue to get those customers. Here's what I would do. I would get them to pay mm -hmm. and give one of them an exclusive and say, we're going to do an exclusive with one company. We don't have the time to do 10. Sure. So it's either going to be jump bikes or it's going to be bird scooters, but we're just going to pick one. And with that partner, we want to set up tents in your popular locations, give out free coffee and free yeah. Gatorade or whatever. And then people sign up. We need to sell them for 80 bucks, but right. we will, you can sign them up and we'll customize them with your logo. Mm -hmm. And then you decide that if they pay 25 bucks, they get $25 in credits and a free helmet, but you still got to give us 80 Right. And then you, you you work them versus each other with an exclusive. So give them a 2019 exclusive and tell them you want half a million dollars in advance. Mm. That's a great point. Have you thought about doing an exclusive with somebody? We have, um, but we've frankly got inbound interest from all of them. And so mm. we're just trying to figure out the best way through so far. Yeah. See, the way you do that on a negotiation basis, you're a negotiator? I guess by default, being a founder, yeah. Okay. <laughs> mm. You sound like you're... Like have a lot of experience negotiating. But well, my dad's the, a litigator who's- settled, Okay, good. Yeah. So talk so to your dad about this. Because what, what happens is- as <laughs> I love Preet, that. As Preet Bahar says, like sure. people will cut it, the former attorney general in New York who got fired by Trump and has a great podcast. He's like, people will negotiate one of two times. One, when you get, when you give them like, okay, we're going to prosecute you. Sure. And the second is on the steps when you're about to start the trial. And they <laughs> realize when they're walking up the steps, like, oh my God. This is actually happening. Yeah. So like Paul Manafort, he's like, yeah. yeah, you know, he'll probably when he's walking up the steps, flip. He didn't. He went all the way. But then on the second one, they were yeah. about to walk up the steps. And what happens? He flips. Sure. So I think the analogy there is don't be afraid to challenge them and say, hey, we're just a startup. We Like Bird's got so much money yeah. and Jump's now owned by Uber. Say, we're looking for a partner for year one. We're obviously going to make this available to everybody. Anybody can buy from the website. But for our logo program and our first deployment, we want you to pre-order 100,000. So, sure. you know, that's 
whatever. If you give them a bulk rate, 40 bucks, $4 yeah. million. Dollars. So we want a $4 million pre-order for, you know, this many helmets, 100,000. And we want you to invest 500K in our round. <laughs> that's the way I would handle it. And what's going to happen is like half of them are going to say no immediately. And then the top three are going to be like, oh, that's like six million bucks, seven million bucks for us to have this advantage over the competitors. Yeah. The ca people could still direct people to the website. Sure. This is about getting cash in your bank to fund the large scale production of these. Yeah. No, so absolutely. be cutthroat about it. Okay. Right. I'll I know that you guys have a mission here. Yeah. But you got to be cutthroat because hardware startups are really hard. Yeah. And you're a hardware startup, essentially. Yeah, pretty and much. And it's going to be brutally hard for you to get venture capital from people on what they're going to perceive as a low-margin business. Sure. That's going to be easy to replicate. That's the negative spin VCs take on this. And they're not sure. wrong. I mean, stuff gets made in Shenzhen. It gets knocked off, right? Yeah, so absolutely. You're going to need to have some advantages. And one of the advantages is having one of these folks invest in the company and sort of overpay uh, in advance or invest in you in advance of this. Sure. But it's a very cool idea. Congratulations. Thank um, you very much. It's super inspiring. Awesome. All right. Cool. Uh, when we get back, I'm going to rank the startups based upon what I think downstream investors from me, an angel and syndicate kind of seed fund, I'm going to rank the companies based on what I think VCs will say. In other words, what would Sequoia or Benchmark uh Kleiner Perkins, Kraft, all the great venture social capital, all the great venture capital firms out there when they are considering a Series A. Okay, when we get back. We all know that your path to financial freedom is looking bleak when you have high interest debt. I've been there. I had those 20% interest cards. It was terrible, especially if your FICO score isn't great. And trust me, I had a bad FICO score for much of my life. Well, Upstart is revolutionizing the process of personal lending. They offer personal loans, but not like the ones at bank or credit unions. No, they go beyond the traditional FICO score to assess credit worthiness. They give loans based on your potential rather than your history. And they reward you based on your education and job history with a smarter interest rate. Quick, two minutes, zip, zip, zip. You go online and you find out your Upstart rate. Checking your upstart rate is always free and very important. It will not affect your credit. Once your loan is approved, the funds transfer to you the next business day. 100,000 users, over 100,000 in fact, have paid off credit cards, fund, they've funded their weddings, they've made large purchases. So here's your call to action, everybody. I want you to go to upstart.com twist and find out how low your upstart rate is. Once again, it's going to only take you two minutes, and it's not going to affect your credit. Go to upstart.com slash twist. Here's a quick disclaimer. Loans by, by Cross River Bank and FDIC-insured New Jersey State Chartered Commercial Bank. Restrictions do apply, and de details are at upstart.com slash twist. Again, upstart.com slash twist. Takes only two minutes. It's not going to affect your credit. Find out what your rate is. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Okay, everybody, we saw four great companies from the Urban X Accelerator, which is run by the fine investors over at Urbanos and Mini. Mini! I love Mini Coopers. Such great cars. So, uh, we saw these four companies. The first one was RentLogic. Um, they are giving a letter grade to landlords and that was super interesting. They got about 100 customers. Campsite with a Y instead of an I uh, is turning open spaces into sort of event co-working spaces. Uh, they have a unit out here where they have a space in San Francisco that's doing well. And they can do 5, 10, who knows, times the revenue of just parking spaces. Clear Road is uh, doing micro... Uh, mileage-based uh, tolls, fascinating. People are opting into it, and this could be the future. You don't need a device. And Park and Diamond, based upon a better helmet that people are willing to wear, and that's collapsible, and that actually uh, doesn't bounce and might, in fact, be better. So lots to unpack here. I'm going to tell you not what I think, because I am not a typical investor. I think slightly differently and I take a higher risk because I'm investing at an earlier stage. I'm going to tell you what VCs will do. 
Now, it's important for you to understand the difference between an angel slash seed investor and a VC. A VC has a $400, $500 million fund. They're going to invest in, you know, maybe 20 startups in that fund, 25, each one getting $20 million. And that would typically come in the form of a Series A and then uh, follow on investments for future rounds. So they keep up their investment. And when they put that $20 million to work, they're hoping that that $20 million returns the entire fund. Because remember, venture capitalists do not get paid until they return the money. So if it was a $400 million fund and they invested $20 million in any of these companies over the life of the company, that $20 million has to go 20x to $400 million for them to even clear the hurdle of returning capital. In fact, it's got to include the original $20 million. So depending on what type of deal they struck, it's going to have to be over $400 million. Um, so if they own 20% of a company, that means that company has to be worth $2 billion for that 20% to be worth $400 million. So they think uh, in big markets and big returns, whereas an angel investor, if you're investing at $5 million like we did in Com or Uber or Thumbtack, those were all $5 million valuations for those companies, we don't have to clear as big of a hurdle and... That's why we will take more risk. Park and Dime is making helmets. They will be dismissed by venture capital firms as a lower margin product. They don't like investing in products. To get past that challenge, you have to point to things like Dollar Shave Club, Lululemon, Spanx, other companies that have made products that exist in the real world that have become multi-billion dollar companies. Most VCs will still not clear that hurdle. Private equity people might, uh, and they're going to need to know if this is a one-trick pony. Okay, you're going to make helmets, or are you going to make knee pads, elbow pads, and other security, and they're going to want to look at the roadmap and see if there's something down the road that would equal uh, a venture-scale opportunity. So they're going to have the toughest time based upon my experience with VCs. So I'm going to put them in fourth place. Um, that is not a judgment based on my thinking. I like the idea. I could see this company becoming worth a billion dollars, but it's going to be harder for the VC to understand it because it doesn't have the same margins as software, right? Software, you make software once, you sell it a hundred times, you sell it a thousand times, you pretty much have the same cost basis. Okay. Now we'll look at the other three, uh, campsite, clear road and rent logic. I feel like rent logic was the uh, most fully baked idea with the clearest path to a large amount of revenue. Why? Because if they become the standard, and the name is fantastic, if they were to become the standard of rating uh, apartments, it would be very hard to displace them. And that rating would become kind of like the consumer reports or um, the wire cutter picking you or PC magazine editor's choice or your um, other scoring systems. I was going to say FICA, but I don't know if that actually, uh, you know, who owns that. But becoming the standard, whether it's Michelin stars, Zagat ratings, Yelp ratings, is a very powerful thing because people can't help but having to deal with you. So if they become the standard and you don't have rent logic uh, on your building, uh, you're kind of going to be screwed and you have no choice but to participate. Restaurants can not ignore Yelp. Hotels cannot ignore TripAdvisor. In fact, the best hotelers in the world, the best restaurateurs in the world are beside themselves with having to deal with obnoxious customers who come in and are like, I'm going to write a nasty Yelp review unless you give me a free dinner, unless you caught me in a hotel. And um, they just can't believe that this is the world they're living in. But even the best hotels and the best restaurants in the world have to bow down before their Yelp rating. So rent logic is my number one. And you see how we did that right there. And this is not through the lens of my investment. All four of these companies are investable in terms of, from my perspective, for me or a seed fund. None of them are duds. But for VCs, I think they will, rent logic will have the easiest path because they're going to look at it as a software company, a marketplace, some hybrid like that. And the monetization is going to be great because every time somebody clicks on that QR code or... Uh, becomes a clearinghouse, uh, they get free marketing by putting those things on the front doors of buildings. Now, that leaves Campsite and Clear Road. And Clear Road feels like it's a more technologically heavy uh, startup that if they did become a standard, they could print money. Um, and Campsite seems a little more esoteric 
And so I think VCs are always going to go with the clearer shot on goal, which I would feel is clear road. But for me, I'm, I actually would prefer to be an investor at campsite than clear road because I feel like campsites is like wild card. Like if it does work, how big can it get? If they could get the flywheel going of some crazy real estate company or growth fund wanting them to buy up these lots and then have a use for them now and future development as a possibility in the future, um, it could be really interesting. And I think the campsites could be multifunctional. Like there could be things on the weekend for kids uh, where if you had a membership, they could program for kids, which by the way, the battery here, which is a private member club that you've probably heard about in San Francisco on Sundays, you know, Sundays was my favorite day there because they would have a bunch of creative people there who would, you could go have brunch and then your kids would play with a bunch of artists who were doing arts and crafts and other activities. So they would basically convert the place into a family uh, kind of space. So I see that for campsite. You could have educational stuff going on there. You could have a date night where, you know, singles come. You could have a co-founder dating night where people are looking for a co-founder. You could have invest. You could do all kinds of different events there. If they can figure that event stuff, I like it a lot. So, but I did say I was going to rate it based upon what I think the VCs would say. So in first, Rent Logic, second, Clear Road, third, Campsite, and fourth, um, Park and Diamond. Now, this does not mean that is their uh, destiny or future. If Even if Park and Diamond has a hard time funding with VCs, who cares? They have a clear shot on goal to get strategics to invest and to get corporations to invest uh, in it, whether it's big corporations that make bicycles and uh, scooters or it's the people who provide the services. Uh, and they seem to have the passion of the Indiegogo Kickstarter crowd and they could crowdfund it. So just because VCs are not in love with your company does not mean it can't be a billion dollar company that everybody loves. It just means you're gonna have a harder time clearing market with them because a lot of VCs have specific signaling that's ingrained in them and they know that a marketplace or they know that software is or consumer um, apps are just like an easy shot on goal, an easy way to get there and they're just gonna lean into that and you need to have creative investors earlier. Meditation app doesn't seem like something VCs would invest in, but we did four years ago with com.com when it was a four or $5 million company. Now it's a 250 to $500 million company uh, based on recent funding and revenue. So again, just because VCs may or may not like a company at the current stage, doesn't mean that they won't invest later when you prove it to them. And that's the key is proving it to them. Uh, they're going to the more outlandish the idea, like Campsite or Park and Diamond, the less they're going to understand it, the more it fits into a bucket for them where they see corollaries of other companies, analogs that have gone public and it's worked, like Rent Logic and Clear Road, the easier it's going to be. And my job when we do our incubator, launch incubator, and I'm sure Urban X thinks like this, is to really just prepare the founder for what's going to happen with those downstream investors. We think about this a lot. Um, but I would like to say to all the companies uh, that I would like to get their updates on a regular basis because these are all fundable by our syndicate potentially or uh, from our fund or uh, for coming to our incubator. And sometimes, I guess this is a big question amongst founders, should you go to two incubators? The answer is generally, if you have to and you can't get funding, sure. Um, but if it's the top five incubators out there, I do think there is something to be said about going to something like Urban X and then Y Combinator or Launch or going to Techstars and then Y Combinator or Launch if you uh, want to get access to those alumni networks and investor networks. So keep that in mind. If you want to be on the program, we do not take uh, solicitations for guests for this podcast. That being said, um, if you have a suggestion for somebody you want to have on the podcast, not yourself, uh, email jason at calacanis.com. And if you have a startup and uh, it's just an idea, don't email me. Don't expect, or you can email me. Just don't expect a response because I don't have time to deal with people with ideas. Uh, but if you do have a MVP or a product or some traction, that's when to get me involved. Email me, jason at calacanis.com. Thank you, Emmy Award winning producer Jackie. Thanks, Ben. And thanks to all of our amazing partners on the podcast. We couldn't do it without you. This week in startups.com, at TWI Startups on Twitter and the Instagram, and rate and review us in the iTunes store. And if we see that you've written a great review, you might get an email from me, or a retweet, or a like, or maybe even 
some of these cups and a t-shirt. We may uh, start giving out, uh, I don't want to threaten y'all, but I'm threatening to send you these paper cups with the This Week in logo on it and maybe some t-shirts and maybe a free ticket to an event. So get those reviews in. I can't promise you, but I don't think I'm allowed to pay you for reviews. But if you do, I'll probably appreciate it. We'll see you next time on This Week in Service. Bye-bye.